Hello, uh, good morning. Um, so welcome you to this World Large River and Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. So today uh, we invite uh, Professor Peter Tolling from the uh, University of Durham. He was talk about the turbidity current. And so uh, this coming Friday, uh, we have Professor David DeMaster from NC State University. He will talk about radio chemistry and how use this one as a tool to help us understand the estuary fluid dynamic and uh, fluid dynamics and also sedimentary process based on all the way the carbon 14 that led to 10. And so uh, Peter, uh, our today's uh, uh, speaker, Peter is uh, currently the professor in the U U Durham University uh, in the marine geohazard and also have a joint position with the Department of Geography and Earth Science. Previously, um, he headed the Marine Geohazard Group at the Southampton, the National Oceanography Center. And also currently he lead a, a bunch of major international project, uh, working with the colleague from UK, from US, um, even Canada, France, China, and try to monitor the submarine turbidity current systems. And uh, so Peter is well, very no, well known about very active globally, uh, try to understand how the sediment transport through the Kenya system by direct uh, of the monitoring. So I think uh, today uh, we are looking forward to, to sh share that should be a little easier. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for everybody's time. Uh, what I'm going to try and do today is take everybody into deeper water. So I'm going to be talking about some of the, they are really the first detailed measurements of turbidity currents. So that should be sharing the first slide, if you guys can see that. Um, I'm going to ask the question, how does the kind of global sediment pump work? from river mouths to the deep sea. And I'm gonna try and show you some of the recent uh, observations about turbidity currents, which are direct measurements, measuring them in the field in action, and what that uh, data is telling us about how they work. Um, that data comes from a series of different places, test sites around the world. Um, there are four that I'll focus on, two in Canada, Monterey Bay, and then a very big system, the Congo fan off West Africa. And just to highlight, that this is a real team effort. So it's from a group of colleagues in Durham, in our group here, but also in Southampton and the NOC in the UK, University of Hull, Newcastle and Leeds in the UK. And it's a real international effort as well with the Canadian team. Um, so Gwyn Linton et al, the group at Embari, Charlie Paul et al, and then John Hughes-Clark started a lot of these techniques off. Jingping, who's, who's here in the audience, started off the ADCP work. So he's been a key player and then various other people from New Zealand, uh, USGS, Delft, et cetera. So it's been a really big effort, big team effort uh, across a whole range of people. So I'm borrowing uh, their papers and results and trying to bring it together here. So if you looked at uh, the- uh, Peter is, is, is not the full screen yet. So can you see, can you see the slides? Oh, yeah, we can, but it's not the full screen. Can you put a presentation mode? Okay. That's okay? Yes. Cool. Give me a shout if that stops working, but hopefully we're okay. Yeah, now nah, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. So just to say, it's this kind of international team. Uh, there's a lot of people's work that's gone into this. And if you kind of zoomed out and looked at the, the planet that we live on, so now I can't advance here. Oh, here we go. There are a series of mo major global sediment pumps, sediment systems on our planet. So you could talk about river systems on land. Um, and if you compare the river systems to these underwater turbidity current systems, in many cases, the turbidity current systems are even larger. So on the left there, you have the major rivers draining the Himalayas, but the Bengal submarine fan formed by turbidity currents goes beyond the tip of India and it exceeds the scale of the Ganges Brahmaputra river system. And similarly for the Indus fan on the other side. So if you also went to the scale of individual events of turbidity currents, 
just one of these underwater flows can carry, in the case of the Grand Banks event, a famous event in 1929 that broke the cables across the North Atlantic, that event involved about 150 cubic kilometers of sediment. So that's about the same as the amount that all the rivers in the world produce for about 20 years. So it can be very episodic, the, these turbidity currents, and the individual events can be extremely large. They can form channels shown in the bottom left from the Indus fan, which are even larger in terms of their scale than anything that rivers produce. So if you look at the, the Bengal fan, the main channel along there is only partly mapped. But if it has the same sinuosity as the bit we've mapped all the way along, it's longer than the Amazon or the Nile. It's the longest channel on our planet. So the scale of these turbidity currents is, is truly impressive at times. And I think as a sediment pump, they would rival rivers uh, or indeed the surface ocean pump. If you look at the amount of material reaching the seabed, they're at least comparable there. Our main problem is actually we have fewer measurements from turbidity currents to quantify it. Perhaps you look at glaciers or indeed some of the processes on the continental shelf as the other major pumps. But turbidity currents can rival or exceed any other sediment pump on the planet. They're important for a number of different ways if you zoom right out. So in the top left, uh, there's kind of the global carbon and other geochemical cycling. So just because of the amount of material they transport. So there's kind of an older view that organic carbon, terrestrial organic carbon is mainly incinerated on the shelves, such as in the Amazon shelf here, kind of this iconic work from many of the people in, in this source to sink group. And then more recently, it's been suggested by Valier Galley and others that the carbon transfer to the deep sea is actually pretty efficient and that most of the organic carbon is buried efficiently. So there are these two different views and the second view is based on the efficiency of these submarine flows. Uh, life on the seabed depends on organic carbon um, as, as its kind of food source. So these submarine flows play a really key role on life on the seabed, sometimes even generating chemosynthetic like communities such as the end of the Congo lobe. They transfer pollutants and microplastics uh, I'm not sure everybody knows this, but most of the global data goes along submarine cables, uh, over 99% of global data traffic. And these underwater cables can be broken. They are broken regularly by these underwater flows. So this presentation, or indeed cloud storage, mobile phone traffic, the internet, everything that we depend on nowadays is going through these cables. And these flows are a hazard to those cables. And then finally, my background is as a geologist. So these flows make really thick sequences that are in the rock record. They traditionally had oil and gas reservoirs, but they're also this, this major archive of, of Earth history. So there are lots of reasons to make these turbidity currents important for a wider audience. And then the really interesting thing about turbidity currents for me is actually how few measurements we have from them. So I asked my colleagues working on rivers, how many of the key measurements, so maybe velocity profiles, have we ever made from rivers? And um, the answer was probably hundreds of thousands and maybe over a million, certainly a, a large number. And for these underwater flows, turbidity currents, we're only very, really making the, the very first measurement. So I think we now have maybe seven or eight places worldwide with velocity measurements through flows. Uh, and not all, but most of that data has come in the last sort of three or four years. And we're still making the first ever measurements of the sediment concentration, the density of turbidity currents. And that's probably the most important parameter of all. And the first publications on that are really out in the last uh, 12 months or so. So it's kind of an exciting time because these flows had so few measurements previously, but now we're getting the first measurements. So it, it was previously really thought, this is captured in the quote below from Ben Neller's paper with Claire Bucky in 2000, that it was pretty much impractical or impossible to measure these turbidity currents at full scale in the oceans. And hopefully, if nothing else, this talk will convince you that it's at least possible. Uh, and that's why it's exciting at the moment as we get these first data sets. And one of the things that, that I've noticed, these series of talks in the Source to Sync series have been absolutely inspirational. And I think some of the previous work from things like Stratiform going on from the stuff on the Amazon and elsewhere have been some of the most impressive studies uh, I, I've seen in the last few decades. I'd rate them right up there. But I always wondered why, why some of those studies stopped at the shelf edge. So with the Eel River uh, and shelf, then the Eel Canyon offshore may carry upwards of 50% over longer timescales of the total sediment that disappears into the deep ocean. Uh, and why stop at the, the shelf break or the shoreline 
you're kind of halfway to what, what I would call the sink if it's sourced to sink, at least for, for many of the systems. And hopefully through the talk, it's kind of a rallying call to study this final part of the system. In some cases, such as on the left there, the final majority of the system. So what I'll do is try and answer some of the, the most basic questions about turbidity currents using this field data from direct monitoring. And if you had to kind of list the, the most basic questions, this is what I'd come up with. The, the first one is how uh, frequent are turbidity currents? How are they triggered? What's their frequency magnitude? And then wrapped into that is how active is the modern turbidity current pump in the world's oceans? Is it a situation where sea level has flooded the shelves and it's been disconnected and basically turned off? Or is it still globally significant? And I'll come back to that at the end. A second question might be simply, what are turbidity currents? Are they kind of driven by dense layers at the bottom, a bit like a debris flow or a snow avalanche? Or are they like rivers? Are they just dilute and fully turbulent? And that's critical for how you model them, how you predict their behavior. Um, and linked to it is, is what's that internal structure and how does it evolve? In some ways for rivers, it's such a basic question and we don't even ask it almost all the time, not always, but almost always, they're dilute and fully turbulent. We don't know the answer to that basic question yet for turbidity currents. So I'll get into that one, that question. Uh, a third one is how do these submarine flows behave? In particular, they've got this ability to exchange sediment with the seabed. So if they pick up more sediment, they get denser and potentially faster. And then they pick up even more sediment, so they go even faster. So there's this runaway feedback called ignition. So I'll try and show some field data testing whether that hypothesis is correct. And a fourth question is how do they sculpt the seabed? How do they make these canyons, deepest canyons on our planet, longest channels potentially on our planet too? So how do they sculpt the, the thing that they flow over? And then a final question might be how are they recorded by their deposits? That's the geologist question, if you like, the one that I came to in, when I first started on the subject. And all of this links into how the sediment pump from turbidity currents affect the wider picture. So organic carbon, pollutants, microplastics, uh, how does this pump affect seabed life? And what are the implications for things like these telecommunication cables that carry 99% of, of the internet? So I'll come on to these questions all the way through the talk. What I'll do is touch on information from four places. Um, efforts have continued in more than these just four places, but I'm gonna focus on these four. There are two in Canada, one in California, Monterey Canyon, and then the Congo system off West Africa. And they're rather different sorts of system. They're either fed by rivers in three cases, or in the Monterey case, uh, not really fed by a river at all, but by longshore drift. The types of rivers are different and the scales are very different. Some are muddier, some are sandier. So these end members for understanding the variability. It'd be a bit like getting the first data from four river systems globally and trying to understand rivers, but you have to start somewhere. And ideally throughout the talk, I'm trying to sort of entrain the source to sink community to, to go into these efforts in the deep sea, because you guys have the skill sets for field oceanography that are the ones that are needed. I'm originally an outcrop geologist. So that's the, the slides on the left there. Uh, and I'm conscious sometimes I have the wrong skill sets for it. So it's just really a rallying call to get people to work on the, the deep ocean part of the system. Some, some of you already are. So in terms of this talk, um, I'll briefly introduce the four places, the test sites where we've worked. I'll then go through the key insights that we've gained into some of these uh, key questions. And I'll finish with a little bit about how active is this turbidity current pump at the present day, and maybe a couple of ideas for some future projects. So the test sites, um, there are four of them here. So Squamish Delta is in Canada, so this is a small system. John Hughes Clark started working here originally. He's kind of the technical genius behind some of these new methods that have been used. He really got things going there. And it's small enough you can test these new methods. So on the top right, there's a bathymetric map of the offshore delta with the river at the top right there. And um, going into deeper water down to about 150 meters, a few hundred meters offshore. So it's a fjord system, it has a sandy river, it's relatively small scale. And John produced these amazing time-lapse images of that delta shown in the bottom right. So there are 93 separate surveys through a whole summer here, almost every day. 
and it shows how that delta front evolves. Um, the second place is not too far away. It's about a day's steam north, a place called Butte Inlet, which has a similar river feeding it, but it's formed a channel system offshore, which is very different. Squamish has very short channels, but Butte Inlet has a 50 kilometer long channel, which winds its way out to the, towards the end of the fjord. It's also less affected by human activity than the river at Squamish. But these are two fjord systems that are sandy and river fed. The third one is work that was kind of with Charlie Paul and others at, at Embari. We instrumented Monterey Canyon over the last couple of years with an array. This is with Jingping's uh, work as well. And we were able to put a series of ADCP, acoustic Doppler current profiler moorings down the canyon and a bunch of other new technologies, including smart objects that record their sense of motion uh, and their speeds. So this was a third system and this one is fed mainly by longshore drift although it's also sandy. And then the final place is the Congo fan. So this is one of the biggest uh, submarine fans on the planet. It's fed by the Congo River, one of the largest rivers on the planet. And we had initial data there, courtesy of Cortis Cooper and others from the upper canyon that was quite remarkable. It's shown at the bottom there. And the timeline is in days and the, the, the vertical axis is in meters up to 80 meters. And this showed that at two kilometers uh, water depth, the submarine flows, the turbidity currents could be a week long, were active for about 30% of the time. So the uh, gas pipeline structure that's going to go under the, go through the canyon was rooted underneath. That's why they collected the data, but it's remarkably active. I'll come back to this at the end. And then most recently, we've had a, a UK funded project with various international partners from Germany and France and elsewhere looking at the Congo system by putting out a whole series of 11 oceanographic moorings all the way out to the deep ocean. So looking at flows on the scale of hundreds of kilometers. And as I'll touch on on the end, in, in January this year, our, our mooring array experienced a submarine flow that went for 1,200 kilometers and that accelerated from the upper canyon at five meters per second to reach eight meters per second in the deep sea. It may have caused almost a cubic kilometer of material to be eroded from the upper canyon. So the data from this project is only just coming in, but we seem to have captured a 50 or 100 year event here. Um, although we had to go and find our moorings again when they all uh, had surfaced and started drifting when they were broken by the flow. So I'll come on to the Congo as the last example, but those are the four examples. There are a few other places where we're active. So the VAR is one in France. Uh, also the Fraser Delta, so this is stuff that Gwyn has led in Canada with a cabled observatory where you can get much higher resolution data. Other places I'm aware of, so Gulf of St. Lawrence, etc. Um, so these four are not the only places where similar monitoring studies are happening. And then just on the right is the place I'd really like to go, is the Bengal fan. So I'm trying in some ways to enthuse people about an international project to go there in the next few years. The biggest system on the planet and probably one of the most active with 15 or so percent of global sediment and organic carbon uh, fluxes. So those are the field sites. Um, the questions I'm gonna focus on at the beginning is what are turbidity currents? So are they dense? Do they have this dense layer that drives them? Or are they like rivers? Are they entirely dilute and turbulent? And, and what are they made of? What's their internal structure and how does it evolve? So to begin with, we were getting data on the velocity structure of turbidity currents. So this follows work by Jingping and others with ADCPs, which can see into the flows and record the velocity profile, um, in some cases every few seconds or a couple of minutes, so high resolution data. And the figure on the top left shows an ADCP profile from just one of the flows in the upper Congo Canyon. So this is work published by Maria Asparov and others in Science Advances a couple of years ago. And it was interesting because as you'll see, there's a hot spot, a very fast moving flow at the front of the event. It only lasts for about 20 minutes at the mooring. And then behind it is this slower moving body and tail that in this case lasted for almost a week. So this event sustained a meter per second for nearly a week, but the really fast bit is right at the front and close to the bed. So the fast bit at the front is actually running ahead of everything else in the flow. It's stretching the flow out. The flow is, should get progressively longer here. And this is a very muddy system. So the rest of the body and tail are probably not settling out very quickly. 
But in many uh, previous flume tank experiments in labs, people had seen a structure shown at the top on the right where the body of the flow was thought to feed the head and the head was slower moving because it has to kind of bulldoze its way through the seawater or the, the ambient. Um, so the body is quicker. Whereas what we see in the field data is rather the reverse. So there's only a bit at the front which is running ahead and everything else is being left behind. The body isn't feeding the head, it's being left behind. So this is a very different kind of view of, of how the velocity structure can be working. And we see similar things in sandier systems, albeit on shorter timescales, the flow is not a week long, but only a few hours long. But these frontal bits, these hotspots with fast velocities drive the event. So the second part of the, the question for turbidity currents is what's their density, perhaps even more important than their velocity, because the sediment concentration, the density is driving the flow. And there's been this debate going back to the very early work of Philip Coonan in the 50s about whether turbidity currents are entirely dilute and turbulent like rivers or whether they are kind of driven by dense layers. And typically that question was being answered by looking at ancient rock outcrops. And when I was a, a kind of field geologist, that's what I did. And I came to the conclusion that you couldn't tell that if you took five geologists to one outcrop, you could probably come up with about five different models. And I couldn't tell which one of them was right. So whether it was dense or dilute, because both dense and dilute flows can make pretty similar deposits at times. Hence why we got into monitoring flows originally. So I think from deposits, it's quite tricky to know whether it's dense or dilute. Um, so various of uh, these monitoring field sites have started to answer the question. So this is work by John Hughes Clark from Nature Comms in 2016. So John used these um, multi-beam sonars from a moored vessel, anchored vessel, to look down into the flow in a kind of cross section at the bottom left there. His ship was anchored at Squamish Delta towards the left-hand channel in the top left figure. But this is what he found, and the faster flows seem to have a dense layer. It's difficult to know quite how dense, but a distinctly denser layer right by the bed. And it was actually that uh, faster flow with a dense layer that causes these med bed forms to migrate. But there's evidence for dense layers there. Then we went on and looked at Monterey Canyon. So this is a figure from Charlie Paul's paper, um, a recent paper. And we were able to compare the different speeds that were measured for these flows moving down Monterey Canyon. So they're a bit bigger, they go for 50 kilometers, they reach uh, transit speeds between moorings of up to eight meters per second. But interestingly, and rather surprisingly for us, the transit speed of the flow front between the moorings is quicker than anything we measured with the ADCPs that we trusted. And that surprised us because we thought the flow front would be a bit slower because it has to bulldoze its way through the seawater. So what we think happens is the ADCP has an issue, a blanking distance that can't measure right close to the bed within a couple of meters of the bed. We think that's where the, the fast layer within the flow is, is hiding. Um, that's uh, the fastest bit of this event. So we think the bottom of the flow is fast. And then we also deployed these objects. So uh, rather spectacularly, this is a, an 800 kilogram object. It wasn't intended to move originally, but it was moved by one of the flows. As you can see, it kind of slid. And this 800, 800 kilogram object was carried for just over four kilometers at a speed of four meters per second. So almost as fast as anything else in the flow. It wasn't just creeping along the seabed, it was, it was going pretty quick. And we think this is probably evidence for some sort of dense layer so the fast layer is not just fast, but dense, and it has to be dense enough to raft one of these objects of this scale at these sorts of speeds. So it's rather indirect, but we think this is also evidence for a dense layer driving at least the faster flows. So it ends up with a model for turbidity currents that has this fast hotspot that I started with at the front of the flow, but the hotspot is really a dense layer that's near the base, and that dense layer is probably maybe even a couple of meters thick, but it's able to raft these really heavy objects. Um, so at least in some flows, we think the basic question of what are they is answered with the, the answer that they've got a dense layer at the base. As these flows run out, they can slow down and then they may well become entirely dilute, but at least the faster earlier part of the flow has a dense layer. So if you want to model these in tanks or you want to model it numerically, 
computationally, you have to try and model this sort of process, not an entirely dilute and turbulent flow. It's not like a river, at least not in this stage. So um, the final slide for, for this section is work by Steve Simmons uh, and colleagues in Hull and, and elsewhere on the ADCP backscatter. So as some of you will be well aware, acoustic Doppler current profilers can measure not just the velocity profile, but a profile of the strength of the acoustic backscatter. And we've tried to invert that. Um, it's complicated because the backscatter intensity depends not just on the sediment concentration in the flow, but the grain size. And both of those are equally important. But if you make some assumptions on grain size, you can end up with sediment concentrations. And an example of that um, inversion is shown on the left from Steve's 2020 JGR paper. And it, it suggests that most of that Congo Canyon flow that I started with earlier on is really quite dilute, uh, less than 0.1 or 0.01 of a percent sediment. But just at the front where there's a red box in that left hand side, um, you can see that, that there's kind of an anomaly. And Steve uh, suggests that this very frontal part is actually quite a lot denser, but the rest of it was very dilute. So bringing all of these different bits of data together, we're beginning to understand the first question of what turbidity currents are, whether they're dense or dilute. So a second question is how do they behave? How do these submarine flows work in terms of their evolution? So there are these various basic kind of hypotheses that have been around for a while, that if they pick up sediment, they can go faster because they're denser, and then they go even faster and erode even more, and they, they feed back. Or conversely, if they go too slowly, the sediment drops out, and then they go even more slowly, so everything drops out. So they're perched on a knife edge. And a third sort of hypothesis is there's a balance, that the amount of sediment picked up balances that that's dropping out, or you're just moving over a hard bed. So that's kind of an equilibrium state. So if we look at the data, this is from Kate Harima's paper in EPSL. Uh, these are plots of the front speed of turbidity currents in Monterey Canyon. Shown in the center there is a plot with uh, flow speed. So that's the front speed as solid lines and the ADCP maximum measured speed as the dotted lines with distance down the canyon. And MS1, MS2 are the different mooring sites where these things were measured. Um, so what Kate's found here is that flows initially ignite, they accelerate, but then they seem to have this plateau, at least the faster flows do, for maybe 20 or 30 kilometers before the canyon widens and they slow down. However, if the flow at the very first mooring or between the first two moorings is just a little bit slower, so the ones above five meters per second have this plateau, but the ones just at four meters per second there die out, sometimes by the next mooring. So there's this bifurcation in the flow behavior above a certain initial flow speed, they run out through the whole mooring array, they're big flows. And if they're just a little bit slower to begin with, they can die out quite quickly. So there is evidence that there is this kind of bifurcating behavior of flows but they don't really keep igniting, they don't keep accelerating, they reach a, a kind of a threshold speed. So we're beginning to, to field test some of these basic ideas for, for the behavior. And Kate was able to sort of show a snapshot of, of various events. So this is a different sort of plot. It's a plot um, of distance down the canyon, but a snapshot at a single point in time. So time one, T1 at the top, a snapshot at time one and 70 minutes later, or 120 minutes later. And some of the Monterey flows have stretched to be almost as long as our mooring array, to be almost as 50 kilometers in length. And the top event is one of these that's just fast enough to accelerate and grow to be really big. And the middle panel shows a second flow, which was only just fractionally slower at the first mooring, but which had totally died out by the third mooring. And that was actually the one that carried that huge 800 kilogram object at four meters per second. So it's a little bit weaker, but it's not that weak. And then there's a final single outlier flow at the bottom that actually grew in size. It's the, it's the one anomaly. Uh, it's also the only event during the summer months that we recorded during that project. We think it picked up a layer of loose stuff of, of uh, weak mud from the canyon floor deposited during the summer. There was something different for that event. But the top two panels show you this bifurcation. And then if we go to the most recent data, so this was recorded only a few months ago. Uh, it's uh, only just got back to us. 
This was an event in the Congo Canyon of West Africa. So the River Congo is just off to the right of this image, which shows the seabed and this Congo Canyon and channel system going along its course, uh, along its meandering course for 1200 kilometers. And a flow in January that broke both of the internet cables to West Africa, uh, so it had a major impact, impact on internet speeds, also caused all of our moorings to surface in a sequence. And from the timings of the cables and the moorings surfacing, we can see that this event started off at five meters per second, but over 1,200 kilometers, it gradually ramped up until it was going at eight meters per second, 1,200 kilometers from source. So this event was probably the largest yet measured, and it was uh, showing that these flows can gradually self-accelerate over very long distances, um, much longer distances than almost any other type of flow. I think this may be the longest sediment flow ever measured in action, and it was self-accelerating all the way. So that was how do they behave. A third one is how do they make the seabed uh, shape? So how do they make canyons or channels? Here I'm just going to highlight work from Martin Heinen in the group um, on Nature Comms. So this was published this year, and it builds on earlier work by John Hughes Clark, Kim uh, and Gwyn from the Canadian Geological Survey. Um, this image comes from Butte Inlet, so one of the field sites in Canada that has this beautiful 50 kilometer submarine channel. And on the right are some time lapse images of a bend in that channel uh, taken every couple of years. We've gone back in and got more repeats. These are the early ones. But I think you can see that there are nick points, so kind of steps in the channel profile, a bit like a waterfall. But those uh, nick points are eating their way upslope at rates of half a kilometre or sometimes more each year. So they're far faster than anything you see in, in almost any river system. The, the nick points are also a bit different to rivers because they're generated by some internal factors within the flows. So with rivers, you can have tectonic uplift or sea level change, but there are no faults in, in this submarine system. There's no sea level effect here. It's all deep in the ocean. So there's something about these systems that can self-generate nick points, which are really fast. And these nick points seem to be what's building and maintaining this submarine channel. So the channels are actually, in this case, really quite different to rivers. And they're dominated by the nick points. This is a sandy system, so this may not always be the case. Uh, muddy submarine channels might be a bit different. We still need to find that out. But, but they're very different to rivers. And this is kind of an image of the time-lapse cross-sections of those nick points with the amount eroded in red, sometimes 20 or 30 meters height of erosion with a nick point heading back half a kilometer a year. And in between the nick points, there's deposition and the erosion and deposition almost balance themselves out uh, over longer periods. That's why there isn't a huge canyon here. So I'd refer you to Martin's paper for more there but they're totally different to rivers. The way in which the bend dynamics work, the way in which the channel is being maintained, it's totally different to rivers. Okay, so the final section I'll come across to the frequency and magnitude and triggering of turbidity current. So how active is this sediment pump? Um, what's the distribution of bigger and smaller flows that run out shorter or longer distances? And this is really at the center of how effective this pump is for organic carbon and other kind of geochemical cycles. So traditionally, turbidity currents are kind of thought to have three main types of trigger. You can have a bit of the seabed that collapses as a landslide. So that's the top figure. That's the slope failure. The middle figure shows a rather odd situation where the river water has enough sediment to be able to plunge to move along the seabed, so-called hyperpycnal river plumes. And then at the bottom, there are river plumes which don't have enough sediment such that their fresh water is less dense with the sediment in than the seawater. And it goes along the sea surface, so-called homopycnal river plumes. And these are actually by far the most common situation. So we did some work, or John did this work originally uh, from Squamish Delta, mapping it 93 times, almost every day for a whole summer. And this allowed us to find out when events happened and compare them in some detail to the plot of the river discharge and the tidal cycles. Um, there's a strong statistical link between when events happen and a kind of threshold river discharge of above, in this case, 300 cumex. That's when it switches on 
but then the events tend to happen at low tides. So the river discharge and the tides are, are driving the, the tempo of this pump. Uh, then we went back and did some more detailed monitoring of these events, which are mainly formed by surface river plumes. So this river is not dense enough to plunge. It's really quite dilute. And in the top right are a series of multi-beam sonar images that are cross sections with the river on the left and going into deeper water on the right. So this is from John's work. And as you watch the red arrow, you'll see a turbidity current just episodically occur for a few minutes. There it goes. And even though the settling plume from this surface uh, river plume, uh, settling plume of sediment is quite sustained for several hours, only in some tidal cycles and only for a few minutes do you generate a turbidity current. But as Sophie Haig has shown in a GRL paper recently, this really opens up many more river systems to generate turbidity currents. This is a pretty dilute river, as shown on the bottom right, which is a plot of river concentration and river discharge, and the red cross is Squamish. So rivers like these are quite common, and we may actually be able to generate, <coughs> sorry, turbidity currents in many more places than we first thought. It really makes them potentially much more widespread. <coughs> so this is one of the important insights into turbidity current triggering. Um, there have been various other things. So Monterey Canyon, we had an event that was not associated with a, a storm or a river flood or an earthquake or anything. It happened on a day when nothing much happened. So we're, we're interested in why that's the case. So one of the big things is that the, the triggering of turbidity currents at Squamish and elsewhere can be controlled by a combination of river discharge and tides. So this turbidity current pump is responding to river discharge and to tides. And that's not just at Squamish. So work by Gwyn Linton at Fraser Delta, uh, a kind of cabled observatory, and this is from his work in sedimentology in 2016, found the same thing. When there are strong spring low tides, that's when you get activity. That's when the river is running high. And in the Congo data, most recently, we get the same thing again. So the two big flows in the Congo system that we experienced in January and then March 2020, they occurred um, after a 50 year flood on the Congo River. So a very unusual flood, but the flood finished in December, end of December. And these two submarine flows occurred two to 10 weeks later during spring low tides or certainly spring tides. So again, we think that almost globally, there are places where the turbidity current frequency and its magnitude is controlled by a combination of tides and river discharge. So we're not quite sure exactly why yet in terms of the process. So on the left are two alternative hypotheses. <clears throat> the first one is that the uh, increased river discharge dumps a lot of flood sediment um, right at the, the delta or the canyon head and that at low tide, maybe due to a uh, release of gas at low tides, uh, due to reduced kind of uh, overpressure, then the, the sediment can just collapse. It's a landslide trigger uh, from a combination of lots of sediment being dumped and the low tides being the final trigger. However, another option is a bit like a tidal a kind of estuarine turbidity maximum. So that's when the flood produces a lot of sediment, but the tides act to trap that sediment uh, at the river mouth or the canyon head and it builds up and builds up and at some point it's eventually uh, kind of triggered episodically. So it's not really a landslide trigger. So we're not quite sure which of these is dominant yet. They're quite difficult to distinguish um, in the field data, but there are some echoes here of the work on shelves where um, again, river discharge and tides were dominating um, places like the, the Amazon, uh, the tempo of movement of sediment on the shelf. So we're quite excited by this recent stuff uh, which is starting to understand the tempo and the controls on the deeper water turbidity current pump. And that has implications for, for geochemical cycles. So the Congo Canyon data, the recent stuff from this year, where we got a flow that went 1200 kilometers into the deep ocean at these ridiculous speeds of five to eight meters per second. And that was linked to a river flood so in that event, the river flood sediment and its organic carbon, presumably fresh organic carbon, was rather rapidly rooted all the way into the deep sea. So there's very efficient transfer of organic carbon from the river mouths to the deep sea. In fact, our estimates of budgets is that over long enough periods, it's almost 100% efficient. <clears throat> 
So we think we can explain some of these recent hypotheses, such as Valia Galli's work on the Bengal fan, based on just cores from, from deposits, uh, showing why the submarine turbidity current pump in some, ses some locations is so efficient for carbon burial. And that's a real contrast to the places like the Amazon shown on the right, where most of the organic carbon is incinerated on the shelves. Um, we think that in systems like the Congo and the Bengal, that organic carbon transfer and burial is pretty efficient. And we think the recent data shows why. Uh, work by Steve Simmons quantifies the amount of sediment being carried in the Congo, at least over our monitoring periods, it balances. The amount of sediment moving through the turbidity currents is pretty comparable to the amount that the river supplies. It's almost 100% efficiency of sediment being carried into the at least the upper part of the submarine canyon. And then maybe every 50 or 100 years, we get a big flood on the Congo River that triggers this even bigger scale of event that both transfers the flood sediment to the deep ocean, but also erodes out all of that canyon fill sediment. So there are kind of these filling and flushing cycles, but it's pretty efficient. So this kind of leads me to the bit, the end where it makes me wonder how active the global sediment pump from turbidity currents is. So there sometimes has been this view of turbidity currents at the modern day that the system is pretty much switched off and inactive. Because sea level has risen, many rivers have been detached from their canyon heads and that most of the sediment sits on the shelves. Some of the early organic carbon budgets globally assumed that pretty much nothing escaped from the shelf. Um, this is kind of the view from the Amazon, maybe some of the other major rivers. But if you go to the Congo and the Bengal, certainly the Congo, we're showing that the turbidity currents are pretty frequent. In the upper canyon, they're frequent they're every 30% of the time. And we've just seen an event that has scoured the canyon and carried stuff to the deep sea. So the Congo is, is probably close to 100% efficiency of sediment transport from the river mouth. And it's, the Bengal fan seems to be another globally important river, maybe 10 or 15% of the global sediment flux and carbon flux, terrestrial carbon flux to the deep sea. The evidence there for me is that that's probably pretty active as well. This is where I'd love to put some more moorings to actually measure it, um, but it looks pretty active. And if you add those two together, perhaps add in some of the small mountainous rivers like the Gaoping Canyon uh, off Taiwan, that again has a canyon head next to a river, you can rapidly get up to maybe 10, 20 or 30% or more of the global river sediment supply is efficiently flushed into the deep sea. Um, so it might be quite active. And then you go on to sources of sediment that are not from the river. So longshore drift like Monterey is uh, feeding a fairly active system in Monterey Canyon. And then if you have submarine landslides just on the continental slope like the Grand Banks event, which had this uh, 20 years of global sediment supply, this 150 cubic kilometers of sediment in the Grand Banks event, you rapidly get to a feeling that this is a pretty active pump. So in some places like the Amazon, maybe some of the other major rivers, the sediment isn't getting to the deep sea, but in, in some places it definitely is. So uh, I think this is a kind of exciting avenue for the future to try and measure a few more of these globally important systems and to close the sediment budgets. I'd love to go to the, the canyon that's offshore from the Irrawaddy Salween system there, the Mataban Canyon, and really see if the, the budget is closed. Because sometimes the turbidity currents are relatively big but infrequent, the infrequent event could still be carrying quite a lot to the deep sea. And similarly, I'd still love to put a, a mooring at the head of the Amazon Canyon as well, just to make sure nothing is going off the shelf there. So that's kind of a run through of these different systems, these different questions. Perhaps it's also something of a rallying call to get people monitoring the second half of the system in the deep sea. Um, there's preliminary data now to show it's possible. And I think there's some very exciting times as we get the first data sets of their types uh, back from the deep ocean. So I'll just finish here with a couple of, of future possibilities. It'd be really nice if we can get efforts coalesced around perhaps the Gaoping Canyon. We have two UK uh, funded cruises there in the next few years. So this would feed on from work by James Liu, Jinping and others in Taiwan and, and China and elsewhere. And then the Bengal fan is the place I'd really like to go with international efforts to perhaps try and stitch together a, a big project there on the scale of the kind of stratiform stuff. 
So if anybody's interested in any of these, please get in touch. So hopefully that is part of the future. The other thing which I'll just finish with here is that technology often drives what's possible. So at the moment, we're also trying to design rather low cost, a few hundred pound sensors with low energy. So you can, you, you can use them for a long time with, with battery power and which can get you the data back without a ship. So we've been looking at things like hydrophones and geophones. And one of the other exciting results from Congo is that the, the, the geophones in our ocean bottom seismometers seem to be pretty good at picking up big flows. So there may be a kind of a parallel technology development theme in the future. And as things become lower cost and you can put more of them in the ocean, you can kind of have these global listening networks. So I'll leave it there. This, these are the conclusions. So the main one is these are exciting times because we can measure these uh, deep sea flows often for the very first time. We're getting data sets of a, of a type and caliber as if you're getting the first measurements back from say river systems. Uh, and I really encourage people within this, this source to sink community to get involved with those deeper water monitoring efforts to go and close the budgets and go to, to what I would call the final sink of the sediment. The, the recent work has had a number of, of major insights. So just to go through some of them, very dilute river plumes can cause these offshore turbidity currents, uh, more dilute rivers than we previously thought. And they may well be more widespread than we thought. We get these kind of uh, combinations of river discharge preconditioning a system, and then final trigger maybe being a, a tide. So you get this combination of river floods and tides driving the pump We've seen that faster flows may well actually be driven by a dense layer near their bed. Uh, and there, there is a dilute cloud, but it's not the thing that's driving those faster flows. The behavior of these flows can bifurcate. They can indeed, if they're above a certain initial speed, get faster and then plateau and go a long way. If they're just a little bit slower than that, they die out. Um, some flows indeed accelerate for 1,200 kilometers, quite a long way, as in the Congo system. And then perhaps another example is these submarine channels that are carved by nick points. So the direct monitoring is, is moving us forward on all of these questions. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to try and quantify how active this global turbidity current pump is from river mouths to the deep sea. But the initial data is showing us it's always rather more active than we thought. And I think globally, it may be much more active than people have uh, uh, presumed in the past. So uh, hopefully that's just a brief run through of a rather large amount of work by a whole range of different people at different places worldwide. So thanks very much for everybody's time. And I'll leave that there. Oh, yeah, thank you. Started. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you really convinced uh, you know, many of us in this source to think community, we do need to go to the deeper ocean because we don't close the sediment budget without to go all the way, you know, the, understand the sediment, how to reach the deep ocean through Kenya or other system. So uh, for the audience, if you have any question, you can simply raise your hand by clicking the participants, or you can type simply, I have a question in the chat, then we can know the sequence who have the question. So when they prepare the questions, Peter, I have some question. Um, I have a, let, let's do a short question. Um, you mentioned the river discharge and the tide play a very important role try to trigger the turbidity current. But uh, in many cases, we know the tropical storm, like a typhoon or hurricane, you know, like uh, in the Bay of Bengal, definitely play a major role to trigger that kind of sediment sliding to the canyon. And at the same time, also the tectonic, like Monterey, I'm, I'm not sure in Monterey Bay, but definitely Bay of Bengal and uh, many other places, you know, tectonic play role to trigger some sediment failure slumping to the canyon. So, but some passive margin, they don't have the tectonic activity. So, but still have a canyon system. Okay. So do yeah, you have a yeah. quick comments or something? So, so there are two scales of flow, those that fill the submarine canyon, and they're still quite powerful but they're not that long run out. And then you get the really big events that flush the canyons. So all of the events we've, we know about for sure that are flushing events have been linked to typhoons, river floods, or indeed earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So you're right, the big events do often have this, this larger scale external trigger. But mm -hmm. in some places, the typhoon, such as in the Gaoping system, 
there was Typhoon Morricot that produced a, a really large amount of sediment that arrived at the Gauping Canyon head. Uh, and that was obviously what preconditioned that system to then have a big flow. But the big flow happened several days after the river flood finished. So the sediment sat there for a few days and then it went. I so see. there's a combination between the typhoon making the river flood and all the sediment come in, preconditioning it. And then the, the rather smaller perturbation that triggered the very final event. So it's a combo. Yeah, how about earthquake? Sometimes, you know, earthquake at the tectonic can also trigger. Yeah, it's, it's one of the big questions. People are also interested in inverting that to go to the deep sea to get earthquake records themselves that go back further in time and on land. So uh, earthquakes can certainly trigger some of the biggest events from the Grand Banks uh, or including the stuff off Taiwan or off New Zealand recently. But we can say at the moment from the Congo data that river floods can make flows that are just as big, Good. that run out just as far. So earthquakes aren't the only trigger to the deep sea. Okay. And the the tri tricky thing now is to be able to distinguish from deposits in the deep sea what was earthquake triggered and what wasn't, because there are yeah. definitely some things that are not earthquake triggered that are pretty big. Okay, very good. Now we have a couple of questions already lined up. The first one is from WL. Uh, I tried to ask him to speak out. WL, can you see what's your name and your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a great talk. Uh, this is Wen from Canada. And then I have uh, two quick related questions for Dr. Tolling. The first one, it's the, you were mentioning that the, uh, the monetary uh, system was uh, fed by the longshore current. And it's very interesting. So uh, I really want to know a little more about how the longshore current can trigger turbidity current in the canyon. And uh, another uh, related question would be, so every example you showed in your talk is related to uh, the canyon system, but but from a lot of the, the, the deep time ancient examples, we don't actually require a canyon as a typ topographic uh, geomorphology to trigger uh, turbidity currents. A lot of the examples we see in Gulf Mexico that without canyons, we still have a lot of submarine channel and fan system. So how would that work? Thank you, Dr. Tolley. No, that, that's really good questions. The, the Monterey triggering is a very interesting story from the Monterey Canyon. Uh, one of my colleagues, Lewis Bailey, has a paper that I think will soon be uh, telling that in more detail. But briefly, what people thought was that the longshore drift carries about 2 million tonnes or so of sediment to the canyon head each year, and that that was mainly during the winter storms. So people who worked on Monterey Canyon, Jinping and others, had always made this link between the storms and when events happened. So what we found with the more detailed data is it's not totally that simple. So that when you get the very exact timing of events, they are mostly during the winter, but sometimes they're before storms, sometimes there's a lag after a storm, and sometimes there's just no storm at all that day. And indeed, we got one flow in the summer, just a single flow, and there were no storms, no floods, no earthquakes, pretty much nothing happened on that day. And that was one of our biggest flows. In fact, it's one of our three big ones that went through the whole array. So we think in Monterey that the sediment supply, which is in this case from longshore drift, not the river, but it's of a comparable magnitude to say the Squamish River, that preconditions the canyon head to be close to failure. But the thing that finally pushes it over the edge and causes sometimes a really quite big flow is subtle. Sometimes it might be a very small perturbation that finally triggers the event. It's just the storms and the sediment supply have preconditioned it. Um, so, so that's kind of the answer to the first one. The second one is also a really good question. We focus mainly on canyons and we'd love to broaden out the range of field sites to different types of end member system. We've, we've, we just logistically even to do one is quite a big job. So this is maybe part of future efforts. I think you're right that the slope systems, even the Grand Banks is an example of, of not really having a canyon and it's huge. Um, so you can definitely get events that are not sourced from the river mouth and are not from the canyon head. And the open slope can have some of the biggest, well, it does have the biggest landslides on our planet. So they'd be super interesting, but we don't have monitoring data there at the moment. Okay, great. So next we have a question from uh, Dai Du from Tongji University. Then we have Jin Ping Xu. So I, I, I think Dai Du is the already offline. So 
His question is a great talk. After five years project, you have got to know in detail to be the current process and the triggering mm -hmm. mechanism. How about the formation mechanism of the thick Bouma sequences? Do you have a good explanation now? You know the Yeah, that, that's the traditional question going back to Kunin's work and the Bouma sequence. So some parts of the Bouma sequence, for those not familiar, I guess everybody will be, but so like the C and the D intervals at the top are clearly from dilute turbidity currents. So they have ripples and things. They were never controversial. The controversial bit, as the question says, is the A or B division at the base of the Bouma sequence, which often makes the thick sands. And I think what we're showing is that the faster moving turbidity currents that are sandy have this dense layer at the base, certainly in Monterey Canyon and John's work at Squamish, and that that dense layer is probably more than a traction carpet, which is what you find in rivers. It's a bit thicker than that, more like a debris flow. And that that thick layer is probably, in some cases, producing your boomer A interval. So the classic debate has been around what, how do you form a boomer A interval? Is it a dilute flow or a dense flow, this massive boomer A sand? And I think we're showing that some flows are driven by dense thick layers. So it pushes you towards uh, the, the dense layer model being possible. Ideally, we'd want to take cores immediately after one of the monitored flows. And typically because of ship scheduling, we can only do it like a year later. But in Monterey Canyon, we can indeed connect in the flow measuring uh, to the deposits, although there, there's not the exact flow that we measured. It may be a, a one that was a year earlier or a year later. We have to assume that all of the flows behave in roughly the same way. So the okay. work from Monterey Canyon might answer that question. Okay, Jing Ping next, then Tom Bianchi. No, I didn't raise my hand. Oh, I thought you unmute yourself. Okay. So, Tom. Yes, thank you. Uh, Peter, fantastic uh, talk. Uh, it, you know, Mead, Allison, and I were interested in, in looking at uh, this kind of thing, and we were never funded in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, but uh, we tried some years back. And so it's really interesting to see this uh, uh, sort of getting uh, revisited. But uh, my I guess one of the things that's puzzling to me when you you think about sort of closing the budget and and finding that much of the carbon actually stays um, intact during its transport, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with Vallier's work, but um, I, I can understand that for sort of kerogen um, type material or, or refractory uh, terrestrial material. But it would seem to me that a good deal of the planktonic, more labile material that gets trapped as this um, very active flow is, is moving its way down uh, deeper into the system, that there would be some burn off. I don't know if there's any information about how much or if there's anything about uh, how much burn is going on during that transport. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, it's just really early days because we're finding ways to, to measure them in action. So I guess you're right that the fresh organic material, the more labile stuff is what you're most interested in, in terms of, of burial or indeed for, for ecosystems. Um, and that much of that may well be in this, this kind of uh, marine organic carbon that's more fragile. My, my feeling would be that it'll, if it's disaggregated, then it will form part of that dilute muddy cloud and that the tail of the event may contain most of that material widely dispersed. And what we're finding is the mud, a bit, bit like you found on shelves, um, settles out probably to form some sort of fluid mud in the tail of the event as the flow gets weaker, and that those fluid muds might be incredibly mobile. So the Congo Canyon, when you try and call the bottom, is just a pile of fluid mud, even, even between events. So uh, it certainly will be at the tail of the events. You may have this kind of pipeline of fluid mud shuffling its way down into the deep sea. I suspect it's that muddy component that carries the, 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 the types of organic carbon you're, you're referring to here. And they may actually carry on for long distances and go right out into the deep ocean. They may go on beyond the end of the channels. So the end of the Congo channel has a lobe, but I think those fluid muds, dilute clouds, they'd be even more mobile. They may go all the way up to the mid-ocean ridge. So it might be really quite widely spread at the fringes at the far end of the whole deposit, but it'd be really cool to go out there and to try and quantify this and see how different sorts of organic carbon are fractionated within the flow and what ends up where. Uh, 
So that would be one of the big questions for maybe future stuff to get into. It'd be pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, follow that question. Um, uh, Peter, uh, Chris Stevenson has a question about organic carbon. Hey, Chris. Hi, Ben. Couldn't resist. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a nice segue. Does the organic carbon and the different types of organic carbon have particular affinities for the different divisions in your turbidite deposits? So let's just call them boomers, you know, boomer A, B, C, D, E. And how do you see that impacting on the burial efficiency um, as you kind of can map out the kind of the flux of organic carbon coming into these deep water systems and then how these different divisions stack together. I think, again, this is, this is a really interesting question. So Sophie Haig had, had a paper from Butte where she showed that the, the rather macroscopic fresh woody stuff was mainly in the Boomer D division, it's the, the upper laminated interval, whereas finer material is probably disseminated through the muddy cap as we, we just went through. But the flows are very good at fractionating stuff, as you've seen, the different grain sizes or densities are very easily hydrodynamically sorted into different yeah. parts of the flow. So in a broader uh, answer, I'd say it's probably going to be pretty efficient. And Florian Pohl and others have shown that in, in lab experiments now. So perhaps the next thing to do is to answer your question properly and, and go out and pick apart deposits, looking yeah. for different ages and types of organic carbon. Uh, also affecting how quickly they're buried and yeah. try and see how that works for sure. Uh, and if I was making a guess, I think it's pretty efficient fractionation according to density and grain size. And I think Sophie's stuff is um, showing that anyway. Yeah, it's pretty compelling. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah nice. Well, thanks, Pete. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Adelika from Malaysia. Adelika. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I was wondering how does uh, uh, parameter like continental, uh, the shelf length and slope, and also the gradient of the continental slope, uh, does it actually, uh, do these parameter actually affect the velocity or the density uh, flow current? They can, they must do to some extent. It's driven down slope by the gravitational pull, depends on slope. But if you go to say that Congo flow that accelerated from shallow water in the upper canyon to the deep water, okay. side, uh -huh. a huge event, the, the one we just measured, um, that was accelerating with distance, even though the seabed gradient on the Congo channel and canyon uh -huh. decreases with distance. So oh, I see. Okay. Uh -huh. that, that change in gradient. In, in other parts of the world, like Montre Canyon, the canyon, the upper part has a remarkably constant gradient. Um, almost unnaturally so in places. Okay. Somehow that system has built itself a particular gradient that it seems to be happy with. It seems to make that gradient. So there may well be feedbacks between gradient and flow properties that, that kind of adjust themselves into some equilibrium-like profile. People talk about rivers in the same way, having a graded profile. Um, but in some events, the flow can overwhelm the gradient, like in the Congo, and accelerate even when the gradient's going down. Okay. Next okay, thank question. you. Next question is Xin. Xin, Shanxin, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Tolin, thank you. Uh, you have mentioned three triggers, uh, including the hyperpignal surface plume and uh, submarine landslide. Uh, which one do you think are more likely to generate hybrid event beds uh, and why? Thank you. It, it depends on if, if the, the hybrid beds, for, for those not familiar, have these kind of debris flow like or fluid mud like deposits sandwiched in that classical boomer sequence. Um, and it, some of them are really like fluid mud layers. So I think any flow that's muddy and slows down a bit like people found on shelves can form uh, fluid mud layers that are quite mobile. So those sorts of, of low strength <coughs> uh, hybrid beds could be, could be formed by any one of those triggers. It just needs to be muddy. Uh, they all, thank you. They all have big class in, probably need a landslide to make them. Um, okay, is the, do you have any other question from all this? Yes, may I have a short question? Hey, Dr. Ma, yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, you mentioned about using hydrophone to monitor the uh, sediment plume. Do you know what are we listen for? Or what we listen to? What kind of frequency or something like that? More detail? Yeah, yeah so that, that's where we're at. We're trying to answer that very question at the moment. So John Hughes Clark had a student at Squamish um, and he was listening at several hundred kilohertz, which is the sort of frequency that somebody like Peter Thorne, who's, who's worked on, on kind of coastal settings would predict as well. So originally we were looking up at those, those higher frequencies, but now we're not as sure. So Gwyn Linton for his data from uh, the Fraser Delta has picked up signals in the hydrophones there from events that we know happen, their, their ADCPs record them at much lower frequencies, we're, we're rather surprised about. So even yeah. down to tens of hertz. So that's a really open question that I'm very curious to, to try and answer and therefore design the right sensor over the next couple of years. So if anybody else has experience of what frequencies are best for monitoring those sorts of events, I'd, I'd be really curious. I think Gwyn and, and the others working on that would be really interested too. It's a good question. Is it, is it possible to carry out a laboratory test to listen? Yeah, it, it depends on. We've actually got clearer signals from ground shaking from geophones, so not the acoustic uh, signal, but the, the ground acceleration. So we're trying to look at both of those. And it's actually quite tricky with the hydrophones because there's so many external sources of, of noise that contaminate the record that they're, they're quite difficult to deal with but we're beginning to get a feel from the Canadian examples for, for those frequencies, and, and most of them are up at the higher frequency. The, the final thing thinking about it is the ADCPs. Uh, so Steve Simmons has showed they have self-generated noise within the ADCP record, and that's at 300 kilohertz. So in Monterey, there's a very nice signal from the flows at 300 kilohertz. So that's up at the frequencies that Peter Thorne would predict. Um, I think he did lab work in a rotating drum so we've, we've got a PhD student, Niall, trying to do some recirculating flume experiments uh, to do that, to see what frequencies uh, the flow generates noise at. And we're worried that there will be lots of, of external sources of noise that might make that tricky. But I think Niall will see if that works in the next sort of year or two. So it's kind of watch this space. We're, we're trying to narrow it down at the moment. OK, thank you. OK, you have a last question, Daniel. Daniel Tech. Daniel, where are you from? Can you see your institution? I yeah, I'm from, uh, I'm from Leeds. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really great, uh, sort of mind-blowing stuff. Um, I was wondering whether you'd um, monitored any flows on submarine channel overbanks and whether you think they also act uh, in the same way as they do within the canyon or channel in the, driven by the dense basal layer and consequently whether they um, are, represent hazards to underwater infrastructure. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, at the moment, we've put most of the AD, almost all the ADCP moorings in the canyon axis, because we don't have many moorings. We're trying to put them where we're most certain we'll get events. Um, in the Congo example, recently, we had some ocean bottom seismometers that we tried to protect by putting out on the overbank levees. And uh, I put the two that I really wanted to protect at the far end of the system. But unfortunately, this recent event accelerated, and that was the worst place to put them. So we should have some data from them. It's only uh, hydrophone and geophone data, not ADCP data, um, out on the levee, but we haven't got that back yet. The French had a levee mooring in the Congo years ago um, that suggests that some of the flows there can overbank um, very effectively in the second half of the system. So there's an avulsion in the Congo channel and the channel is uh, half the width and half the depth and that the flow gets bigger, so it's very good at overbanking during the, the last part. But I think those um, kind of traditional thin bedded levee sequence deposits are probably dilute flows if you go back to the kind of classical boomer sequence. So I'd probably say that most of the dense stuff is along the axis of the channel and on the low. Okay, I saw Jim Ping raised the hand. Jim Ping, go ahead. So you are- Yeah, I, I be, uh, fascinating stuff, especially the the Congo Canyon. Sorry, I wasn't able to join you in the Congo Canyon. I I like to make a comment on your uh, call for writing up uh, the effort to do the next study. Uh, so let's 
think that's frozen. Is everybody else? Okay. Yeah, Ting Ping. Uh, maybe you have a connection problem. <laughs> I think the future efforts are key, and it'd be really cool to gather people into these bigger projects. It's how good marine science is often done, as you guys have shown on the shelves for, for many decades. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, good. So I, I like your call for running up the efforts for the next study. So my suggestion is let's keep the conversation going with Paul and other folks in this group and your group. Uh, one thing I like to comment is uh, from uh, attending several meetings in the past several months, um, there are a, a couple of initiatives in, in, in here in China um, to uh, conduct investigations, uh, mainly in the Northern uh, Indian Ocean, including Bengal fan. So keep that in mind. Uh, we might have something um, uh, to talk about in the future. Okay. I think that would be tremendous. I think there's a German cruise scheduled there uh, with Elder Miramontes and others, um, but and getting permits maybe might be one issue, but I think that Bengal system is probably the most exciting of all of them. I think it's probably going to be even more active than Congo because the amount of sediment that goes in and globally it's the most significant. So it seems a really obvious place to go now. Particularly the, the ODP, they found the charcoal, you know, the debris of the tree, you know, they claim the forest all the way from the Himalaya to the, the deep sea. I mean, of course, that should be very interesting. But thank you, Peter, again. And this coming Friday, we have another talk about Dr. D, uh, Professor David Master talk about, he will talk about Amazon, Yangtze, the Mekong, the Antarctic, and uh, some uh, even the East Coast of US, the shelf, you know, the way the radio chemistry as a tool to help us understand the sedimentary process and the fluid dynamic. I uh, think it's, uh, you know, please mark your calendar and coming back. And so I think it, it is great. Thank you, Peter, very much. And thank you for the audience. I know it's very late in China. So, uh, so thank you. Many people stay very late uh, last night. I, I need to go back online to check the news to see who will be our president. <laughs>